So the artist that I've met recently is a guy called Zach Lieberman and he's not only a great artist but he's also a great coder and he actually invented a, and gave away a framework called Open Frameworks for artists to create designs and he's then added that into ARKit and I'm actually going to show you an example of that through the talk. Um, and you can find his work on Instagram is where he posts most of his work, FYI. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about the future. The future is sensory. We at Adobe Design, hang on, I've got to get this right, next slide. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I'm doing well. Um, I run the Adobe Design Lab, and we're a small team, but we have a big impact on the future of creative tools for Adobe. We really focus our, our outlook on being human-centered design approach and solving problems that designers have today, but really need a tool for in a few years' time. And I've been in the AR industry, or augmented reality, other people know it by VR or immersive design, any of those words. Um, and I've been doing this for eight years, and I've been inspired through my work to create tools that will enhance freedom, that will remove physical boundaries of communication, and that will build empathy across cultures. And today, I'm going to talk about why are we thinking about the future as sensory. I'm going to explain what sensory design could be, and I'm also going to give you one good design principle that you can take today and apply to any sensory designs that you are going to do in the future, build in the future. This is a great quote that I want to just read out to you. It's a great place to start by an Australian UX designer called T. Hugo, and he said, we're moving from a time of static information toward held in books and libraries and bus stops through a period of digital information and now towards a period of fluid information where the next generation will expect to be able to access anything, anywhere, at any time. Isn't that crazy? So I feel this deep responsibility as a designer, and I'm sure a lot of you do too, to engineer, to design, to craft this new period that we're entering of fluid information, that it acts well, that it builds a better, happier, future for us. So what does this future look like? I'd like to do a little mind experiment with you. I'd like you to all close your eyes, just for two minutes. Don't worry, nothing's going to happen. You'll be safe. You're safe, in a safe place. So close your eyes, and I want you to go. I can still see eyes open. Oh. <laughs> I want you to go to your happy place. Now we all have a happy place, even if it's fake. <laughs> and I bet this happy place is not filled with lots of screens and devices and artificial light. It's probably got lots of sunshine. You're probably surrounded by natural things, maybe beach, a forest. It feels natural. The sunshine feels good on your back. Maybe you can even see friends playing, running around, making sandcastles. We could say nature makes us happy. Maybe even natural things make us happy. And happiness is a great motivator. Maybe that's why we keep redesigning everything, trying to find that happy place. OK, you can open your eyes up now. Just hold that thought, though. So let's start our future here. Let's start the future with the idea that designs should feel natural. Now, I bet in your happy place that you're in, it wouldn't have been long before you would be grabbing for your phone, let's be honest. We want to look at information, connect to our friends, see what the latest tweet is. But I wonder if we can explore the idea of accessing this information more naturally. 
more with our senses than the way we do with everything else. Something that is less intermediated, something that is less in the way of us experiencing things like screens and keyboards and mouses. I mean, humans, we are simple, we like simple tools that help us connect, that help us create and learn. And our phone isn't quite that, is it? It is limited, it is, does intermediate these experiences. And this, this idea really fascinated us at Design Lab. The idea that we could think about a system of naturally, of a natural way of accessing information. So we set a goal to think of what is a new design system that is going to help us design in this way. And I want to start exploring that with you today. And it's not, I don't have all the answers and I don't have the conclusion. I'd like you to join with me and start what I've learned and continue, and continue to share that with other people. So we dug deep and we had a look at what other people were doing. And Google CEO Sandar Pichar a few weeks ago launched a range of new devices and he said during this launch that yes, we've come a long way with multi-touch, but we, he thinks that we will be interacting in a more conversational way, more sensory ways using our voice, vision and other things. And he's using artificial intelligence and voice to start that off. Okay, so we dug a little deeper again. What is sense? Well, Wikipedia says, sense is a physiological capacity of organisms that provide data for perception. Basically, we are sensory machines. And we are also, we also think with our senses. So your body and your senses or your body and your mind are interconnected. They are not a separate thing. So this is kind of a powerful thought. So we kept digging again. Surely somebody's been using this idea of influencing your mind through senses. And sure enough, for the last 10 years, people have been using sensory design, just not in the field I've been exposed to in user experience design. Product design, physical product design, have been using it, for instance, the transport industry, the gaming industry, and they use sensory design to try to design the whole brand experience from smell and touch and taste, from all the different ways that you can experience a brand to influence the way that you think about a brand and give a single message. And this can be used for good or bad, of course. They've even got a system that, they've, that has been designed where they're collecting information, modeling and analyzing it. And this helps them design and test products. Might be a good tool for us. So game design has been using artificial intelligence for quite a while, and they call it sense design. And it is to develop the way other characters will naturally relate to you in your playing a game. And another way they use it is to design your opponent or your ally that acts naturally to you in the game as well. Even the most, some of the most sophisticated game systems can understand our behavior before we do them and then engineer a different outcome than maybe we would have naturally led. Sometimes I feel a bit funny about that. Sometimes I see the possibility of great immersive experiences. So now let's get into what actually is sensory design. The current design systems do not work for designing in the real world. And myself and anyone in the immersive industry has been very frustrated that there isn't a common language. There isn't a way to design and communicate and be build better designs. So I, we took a look at what is working in other industries. And material design that Google invented is a really good example for designing apps, for designing websites, because it is thoughtful about our, the way that we interact humanly. It, is open to our creativity to change and add things to it. And it's just a very practical guide. So it's been this huge success. Who here has used material design for app and web design? OK, I think a lot of hands, <laughs> at least half. So let's start comparing what sensory design could be compared with material design. Now, material design 
and the word material they use as a metaphor. It's about the tactile reality, how, the, how you touch things and how things move when you touch. So we could think of sensory as a metaphor as well, but a physiological one, that it's not just touch, it's all other senses as well. It's using our body and our mind. Now let's compare three other factors. Material design, it's a visual language, and it's been inspired by a study that Google did called Paper and Ink. So sensory design is also visual, but it's also auditory, it's also tactile, it uses all our senses. And it should be inspired by human perception, how we perceive the world through our senses. Our senses are not only peripheral to our mind and our cognition, our senses change the way that we think. This is a lot of power in designers' hands that we need to consider and think very carefully about how we encourage the development of this technology to be more human and natural. Because sensory design can be hugely effective for learning, for communicating, and for creativity. So now another, the next way that we can compare material design is material design is a system of motion. It uses motion to make sense of the UI. Motion gives us feedback and we understand what's happening. Let's compare this to sensory. It's a system of responses, not just motion. And our presence gives it meaning, not movement gives it meaning. Just being there causes a system the, in, the UI to interact, and we give it meaning. Does that make sense? Good, I'm <coughs> seeing a few nods. <laughs> okay, the last comparison. Material design uses touch for input, and motion for output, and output is like feedback. So sensory design, it uses touch, but speech and location, context for input and other things. But, uh, and for output, motion, speech, the same things for feedback. It's responsive both ways. But there's something different about sensory design that material design doesn't do. And that is that sensory design can respond without input. It can respond intuitively, eventually. That's where we are heading. It can sort of maybe second guess you a little. And this can be very helpful or annoying, depending on how we design it. <laughs> OK, so let's break down the sensing technology. Because if we know what the machine is made of and how it acts as a human, we can use it to design more natural interfaces. So the GPS is like our location, where we are in space. The IMU, or the inertial measuring unit, which is in all your devices, well, mostly in your mobile devices anyway, it's like physical movement. The mic and the speaker, plus artificial intelligence, is like is hearing and speaking. The camera on our phones and other devices, and computer vision, give sight. Gestures, controllers, and haptics give us a sense of touch. And the massive computer power that we can use today, plus artificial intelligence, can act a little like a brain. And if we combine all of the above, we can use it to understand our intent and even understand your emotions. So these are all things that are at our fingertips to design with. Some new tools. OK, we also have three other types of perception. <laughs> we have, I've described the six, but there are other ways that computers can't compute this sense, but we can still use it in our designs. And one is proprioception. It's the way how, how our bodies respond to the environment, like balance. The other is our perception, not the reality of, our perception of time and hunger and thirst, for instance. And the other is our mag magnetic field perception, which is this uncanny feeling 
that we have of direction. Now we are going to build up the sensory properties. We've pulled down and looked at and broken apart the different compute powers that we can use. What are some of the properties that we can use, like material design uses the visual properties? And we're going to talk about five properties. And if you take note, you can use these also when you're thinking about designing for a sensory experience. The first one is designed for many senses. We are multi-sensory. And the more senses we add, we enhance our sense of joy of an experience. For instance, why do we go to a band, see a band when we can listen to the song? Why do we love to hang out with friends instead of just Facebook? Is it a way that we can connect in a more meaningful way when we're using all our senses? OK, second, designed for direct input. Like we've already said, try to remove the technology that is taken intermediating the actual experience you want to have. And I'm going to give you an idea on how to think about this as a way to force ourselves to design for other senses. Get rid of the screen. Think about how a blind person might use the iPhone. Maybe a hearing impaired person, how they listen to music through the vibrations in their stomach. And maybe other, many other ways that we can learn more about sensors and how we can use them. And we're fortunate, fortunately, that some big tech companies have been investing a lot in developing some technologies in touch and speech and gesture, like I mentioned with Google, that we can turn like dumb objects, <laughs> imbue them with the magic of the internet, and potentially turn the digital cloud into something that we might be able to touch and move. Third point is about design for physical properties and keep them in mind when you're designing, because if we're putting digital things in the world, they actually become physical by nature. They have to take the light of the environment. They have to respond to the size of the environment and the shape of it. And this next video I'm going to show you actually was the one thing that inspired me to start thinking about sensory design. It's done by an amazing artist, I think one of the best uh, visual effects artists called Samuel Holmiel from Man and Machine. And when I saw this, I thought, digital objects can look physical. They can be, look so physical that you want to touch them, that you have a sense of them. How cool is that, right? Did you feel like you wanted to touch that material? So I shared this video and the idea with a few friends on a Slack group, and some friends around Adobe, and I got some interesting responses. One was by a friend called Graham Antiel, and I'm just going to read what he said. I call, I call it Elastic UI. When he looked at that previous video, he said, I've been thinking about this as well. And I called it Elastic UI, where elements are designed to squeeze or fit or expand, rapidly change based on conditions. Where the content and the UI go hand in hand. It is really an exploration of air and of negative space that it occupies. It's a real world adaptive it adapts to the real world as well as fun and playful. And he sent me some examples I want to show you. So we're moving from 2D screens to a 3D world. This is the highest, this is the biggest change in design thinking to date. It's the first time we are moving from a rectangle screen from the dawn of time, from stone tablets, now to our tablet phones, to our screens, and it is going to mess with our minds. 
this is going to be a hard concept for us to understand. So user interfaces will have to adapt to an uncontrolled environment. We don't know where somebody is. That is a big change. We don't control where somebody is experiencing these uh, sensory experiences, augmented reality experiences. Our design tools are going to have to be 3D in nature and in approach. Alex Kepman, who is a, a guy who works for Adobe, an amazing technician and thought leader, he said, I believe our children's children will grow up in a world devoid of two-dimensional technology. That's where we're heading. So I want to share a little bit of work that we've been doing at the Adobe Design Lab. Some examples. Um, we've been working on three problems. From a human-centered design approach, using sensing technology. I can't actually show you the work, but I can tell you about the work right now. But I do have some examples of other people's work I can show you that's fun and sort of gives a, a reference to what we've been doing. First, we explored the world, what the world might look like if everyday objects had magical sensory powers. We made a wide, wide variety of digital interactions and attached them to everyday objects. Some of them could replace the existing digital physical interfaces that didn't work so well and connect them to other objects like a microwave to a, an oven. Um, we explored ways that we can see information that's hidden and explore what, how to do something, do anything. You could overlay information that would help you build furniture, that could teach you how to play an instrument, or karate, which I enjoy. It's a bit like a wonderful mechanical YouTube. <laughs> we also started exploring and visualizing how music could look pouring out of a speaker. It was amazing to sort of see music have this sense of tangibility. You could touch it, you could play with it, you could remix it with friends. It changed the way that no other technology could change music and collaborate together with. I'm going to show you this video of somebody I mentioned earlier, Zach Lieberman, and it's a simple exploration he did using voice AR kit and visualizing sound. This is a test of talking and seeing what happens when we record audio in space. This is a test of talking and what happens when we record audio in space. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Can you imagine you can move your phone backwards and forwards and mix your own sounds? Okay, the next project we looked at took us into a deep dive into a designer's workflows and processes. We found many opportunities where emerging technology can enhance creativity or support it. We looked in depth at what sensing technology can capture from the world. And we realized that we can capture movement from anything. We can know what things are by looking at them. And we can know what the size of something is. This has never been done before. And we can take this movement, this measurement, and transfer them to a digital object. So I'm very excited by this possibility that we can give anyone such a simple animation tool. No longer do you need, uh, uh, you know. <laughs> no longer do you need to actually to go by frame by frame to animate. You can just capture the motion and apply it to a digital object. That's what I meant to say. So I want to show you this. For a second, imagine that you can track your body 
and you can apply a very cool procedural texture to it, and this is what could, you could do. Move over face masks. Now we've got body masks. And lastly, we've been supporting a, collection, a collective of musicians, 3D engineers, and machine learning experts to bring creative tools to aspiring artists and musicians. And this has only been feasible this year, well, technically feasible this year, with the AR kit and AR core coming to so many phones that by 2019, there'll be an estimated one billion phones that have AR enabled on them. And we, so we can combine human play and creativity with this AR site, with spatial audio, physical movement, and all in real time. I want to show you a work that Johan Mann did where he combined artificial intelligence, a piano and a computer, and made them wonderfully serendipitous. He uh, also explains the tools that he's using, and you can take note of those tools and do your own experiments. It picks up on stuff like key and rhythm that you're implying, even though I never explicitly programmed in the concepts of key and rhythm. It was cool to see people use it in ways I didn't expect. Instead of taking turns, a few people played at the same time as the neural net's response, kind of getting in a creative feedback loop with the computer. It's also fun to just mash the keyboard. The neural net tries to return something coherent from any input that you give it. I made all of the code open source, and the neural net that I'm using is from Google's open source Magenta project, so anyone can grab it and train their own net. I wanted to put this experiment out there just as an example of the many kinds of things you can make with machine learning and music, and I'm really excited to see what other people do. So, I told you at the beginning of the talk I would leave you with something to take a good design principle that you can use when you're designing sensory experiences. And 2000, in about 1970, Dieter Rams wrote 10 principles of good design. Has everyone seen these before? This is kind of the backbone for good design, as we've known it for, since the 70s. But Dieter Rams, he didn't live in a, a world where design can push back, where it can respond to senses. Design was a one-time thing. You designed and you put it out in the world. He just couldn't have imagined adaptive technologies that understand your intentions. He would have blown his mind that remembering the past action, person's past actions and then personalizing an interface, is that that was possible? Dita Rams designed things that people looked at. Design can now look back at us. Design has changed. So I believe if Dita Rams was writing his design principles today, he would have added an 11th. Good design shows empathy. Design sen sensory systems that bring out the best in humanity. And this is a good principle to design sensory systems for, with. Now, I think that actually we can have a happy place that is filled with digital experiences that is more human, more natural, and empathetic. And although it may seem inevitable that the public wants to buy watches and gadgets and more tech devices, maybe we could give a little bit of thought to adding sensory technologies that are more human by nature. Thank you.